If you've bought an AMD Ryzen CPU, I'm going to tell you some important things you have to know when setting it up, as well as some really nice tips and tricks. So let's get started. Hey guys, Tiago here. Today we're going to talk about the AMD Ryzen CPUs. Now, if you guys have recently gotten into AMD, and a lot of us have, myself included, I used to have so many Intel systems, but as AMD crept up and started doing better and better systems for better prices, I switched to using AMD, and I think most people did as well. But you have to remember that since a lot of people were used to Intel for years and years, they were pretty much the only game on the block, there are going to be a couple of key differences that are very important to know. Some of it is going to be very basic. I'm going to reiterate it just to make sure that everybody knows. Other things may be a little bit more complex that even a more advanced user may find helpful. I'm also going to put time codes in the video so that way you guys can see the different sections and go to whatever is useful for you. And remember, if you like the content, remember to subscribe. Thumbs up on the video helps the YouTube algorithm, makes me happy, and it's always very appreciated. So the first important thing that we're going to talk about, and that's going to be the actual physical CPU itself, as well as the motherboards. Now, this is an X570 motherboard. This is the Asus Impact. One huge difference between something like an AMD motherboard and Intel, you'll notice that the pins are going to be on the actual CPU, while on an Intel motherboard, you're going to have those pins on the motherboard. Why is this important? Well, it's actually a lot easier if you're holding the CPU around. Let's say you take this off and you're holding it around. It's a lot easier to drop that little CPU and bend one of the pins. Sometimes if you bend a pin, you may be able to bend it back, but in a lot of cases, you may really damage your CPU and especially them being so small and you're moving around, you can actually, um, you know, hit it against like the RAM or even drop it on the ground and really damage your CPU. So when you're doing an AMD build, that's going to be the first thing that I tell you guys, be very careful with these CPUs, because if you drop them, you could really destroy it very, very easily. And not only that, one of the other big differences differences that happens between these AMD motherboards as well as Intel if you're used to that. On the Intel motherboards, when you put the CPU in and you close down the, the little latch that's there, it's a much, much more secure application. It really seals it in all around. While on AMD, as you see, you really have this little bar here. And in my experience, it really isn't enough in most cases. And I'm going to give you guys a very good example. Um, a lot of applications that you put an air cooler or an AIO or a CPU cooler, even AMD these own stock cooler, very possible that the thermal paste in between the CPU and the liquid cooler itself could really get very, very sticky. So let's say you're yanking off that air cooler. I've seen many cases where the CPU will come along with it, and that could be very dangerous for a few reasons. When you're yanking out an air cooler, especially if it's in a case, you may be moving it around, and once again, those pins on the CPU are going to be exposed. You may hit it up against something with the motherboard. You may not even see that it's happening. Now, some of you may say, I've always removed you know the cooler from amd cpus i've never had that problem but in some cases you can and it's going to depend also on your thermal paste some of it is going to adhere a lot more strongly be a lot stickier and like i said in my experience this little bar here really isn't enough to just hold the cpu in place intel does have a better mechanism when it comes to that and of course like we mentioned before the pins are going to be on the motherboard and in intel's case the cpu doesn't have any pins on the back so it's generally a little bit safer you still don't want to drop it but but it's a little bit less susceptible to damage. So that's certainly something you guys want to be very careful with, especially removing air coolers. Sometimes it may get stuck even if you're careful and you twist it. It can be a very, very tricky process depending on the thermal paste that you're using. And then of course, when you're installing the CPU on the socket, you'll notice that there's usually like a little triangle or a little indication of where the CPU goes. All you want to do is look at your motherboard, look at the CPU itself, and then you'll be able to match that and put it in place. If you put it in the incorrect position and you try to jam it in there. Remember, once again, you can also damage these pins. This will be true as well on the Intel motherboard. You can really damage them if you're trying to just throw the CPU in there without carefully lining everything up. And it's even more true on these Ryzen processors just because of those pins on the CPU. And the second point that we're going to talk about is going to be cooling your Ryzen CPU. Now, one thing to know, when you buy one of these Ryzen CPUs, there are two ways that it can come. One way, for example, this is going to be a Ryzen 7 5800X. This is not going to come with the air cooler in the box. So you're pretty much just getting the CPU. And I can show you the space in here. This is the space where you should get an air cooler depending on the CPU that you buy. So just keep that in mind. So just keep that in mind when you're buying a Ryzen CPU. Not all of them will 
come with the air cooler. You can easily check that. For example, the 5800X, like I mentioned, does not, even though it still is the X variant, they still include that in the box. Of course, the 59 and the 5950X will also not have that Wraith cooler. And for the Ryzen 3000 processors, make sure to check as well. But then some of them, even like the 3900X, did come with the Wraith cooler, but then the 5950X didn't. I guess the idea here is that these chips are definitely going to run a little bit warmer, a little bit hotter than some of the lower end chips like a 5600X. And thus AMD expects you to either do like a high end air cooler or do some type of liquid cooling. Even for something like the 5950X, AMD really recommends doing some type of liquid cooling just because these CPUs are going to run a lot hotter than normal because of their performance. So remember when you're buying and the ones that don't come usually have a little bit smaller box like this filled in and the ones that do come with the air cooler, they're going to have a little bit thicker box. Like for example, even the box for the Ryzen 3600 is going to be a lot bigger than the 5800X because that one comes with the Wraith cooler and thus it needs a little bit more space in the box itself. And another note on cooling, these Ryzen processors really like when they're a lot cooler and they're cooled properly. The more that you can cool it, the more performance you're going to be able to get, the more that you're going to be able to boost your chip, you know, with PBO and different things like that. So remember to put as much cooling performance as you can on a chip like this. And my own build of the X570 Godlike with a 5950X, I have a water-cooled EK magnitude block. That build has a 480 millimeter radiator on the top, a 360 on the front, and a 5 60 on the bottom. I'm also going to be cooling the GPUs later on with it. So that's an example of a really overkill setup, but you are going to get the best performance the cooler that these chips go. And yes, even with something like the 5600X, you're definitely going to get much better performance if the chip is running cooler. So for the next point that we're going to talk about, will these new Ryzen chips actually work on the motherboard that you have or which motherboard should you get? We're going to talk about updating the BIOS as well. For example, these Ryzen 5000 chips, there are going to work out of the box technically with X570, B550, and the A520 motherboards. Basically everything that's a 500 series. Now 400 series support supposedly supposed to be coming next year, but this is going to be a selective beta BIOS from different manufacturers. So AMD doesn't guarantee that Ryzen 5000 will work on the 400 series motherboard. It's going to depend on various manufacturers actually implementing that support. So if you definitely know you want to run Ryzen 5000 and you want to do it now, if you can get a chip, basically your best option will be the 500 series motherboard. And then the question is, is it really out of the box support? Well, technically, yes. I'm going to give you guys an example. When I bought this Asus Impact motherboard, it was pretty much right around the time that the Ryzen chips were released and I bought it brand new. So when the motherboard came and I put in the Ryzen chip, guess what? It didn't start at all. I got an error code. It wouldn't start. It wouldn't even boot pretty much no signs of life at all from the CPU or the motherboard. It wouldn't even let me boot into BIOS, which in the past basically meant that AMD maybe would have to send you a cheap CPU to put in there, or you would have to have like a Ryzen 3000 to put in there. Cause while the motherboard was brand new, the BIOS that was on it, even though it was a more recent one, maybe from like the summer or something like that, it wasn't one of the more recent BIOS updates. You have to have one that's gonna be at a certain cutoff point and you'll be able to check with your own motherboard board BIOS. It's not necessarily the absolute newest one, but it is a fairly new one. So even a new motherboard like this, brand new in the box, would not boot out of the box. So then you have basically two choices. The first one, if you're lucky enough to already have a Ryzen 3000 CPU, make sure to just update it, whatever motherboard you have, to the latest one, if you have X570 or B550, and then it will definitely work without a problem. But what do you do if you don't have any Ryzen 3000 chips, and you've just purchased this motherboard, and pretty much nothing things booting. Well, the one thing that you can do is going to be a BIOS flashback. Now, keep in mind that not every single motherboard will support this. Typically, it is seen on some of the higher-end motherboards, even on an X570 ASRock Tai Chi motherboard, which is, you know, a $270 motherboard, and it does have that, but maybe cheaper B550 and X570 motherboards may not have this BIOS flashback feature. This one does. So basically what you do, you're going to have to get a USB stick, use another working computer, and basically put the BIOS on there. The newest BIOS for your motherboard. And then basically you put that USB stick right where it says BIOS. Usually the motherboard will have a special little USB slot that you can use it for other things, but specifically you have to put it in here for the BIOS. And then with everything off, 
you're going to hold that little BIOS button. And usually, like for example, this one, it'll change a couple of colors. And they say it should be pretty quick, but this actually took a few minutes. So just be patient, read the directions exactly. After it flashes certain lights and a certain number of times, usually it'll turn off. And then you just go turn the computer on and you should have the newest BIOS and you'll be able to boot right with the CPU. That's exactly what I was able to do with the Ryzen 5000 CPU. And I was very thankful that this board actually did have that BIOS flashback. So if you guys are looking for a motherboard and you don't have a Ryzen 3000 CPU, just to make sure that it's going to be out of the box compatible, I would say try to find one with the BIOS flashback. Now it's possible that the new X570 motherboards going forward, they are probably going to have the newer BIOS updates from the manufacturer. Something else we're going to talk about with these Ryzen chips, how about overclocking? Well, typically the Ryzen chips already come performing pretty nicely out of the box. A few things that I like to do when I first set up my motherboard. First, you want to turn on your memory's profile. It's usually profile one. Now, on Intel, this is going to be called XMP. So if you don't see XMP on AMD motherboards, that's okay because that's more of an Intel standard. Basically, you just want to turn on the profile one so that way your RAM isn't running at sort of its base speed. Then you'll be able to get whatever it is that you bought 3200 megahertz CL16 or, or whatever it is. So that's definitely something that I do first. And then with overclocking, usually these Ryzen chips do come performing pretty nicely out of the box. They don't have a massive amount of overclocking headroom. One thing that you can do that's usually going to be right in your BIOS if you go to settings you're going to see something that says AMD overclocking and if you go to something that says PBO that's going to be a performance boost overdrive often it's going to be set to sort of auto your motherboard will decide depending on your cooling if you have sufficient cooling and you want to get some more overclocking without having to tweak all of the settings you can turn that PBO to on and I've seen some pretty big jumps and results and then a couple more interesting things to know about the AMD platform in general Remember, you can do PCIe Generation 4, and while this doesn't necessarily mean that much for GPUs now, even though something like the RTX 3000 series and AMD's big Navi GPUs technically do take advantage of that, this is more something that's going to come later on. You can take advantage of PCIe Generation 4 with very fast NVMe drives. These certainly get much faster speeds than normal. Now, if you're going to notice a difference between that and a PCIe Generation 3 um, NVMe drive that's already fast, I don't really think you're actually going to notice a usable difference unless you have all PCIe generation 4 drives and you're swapping files between them then yeah if you're doing a lot of large projects and files even though it's going to get expensive to have so many high capacity and fast drives then that's the only use case I think you would notice a difference but it's certainly something to know and of course x570 will give you the best PCIe generation 4 support for NVMe drive something like b550 will have a more cut down version it still does have PCIe generation 4 generally you might be limited to just one gen 4 and NVMe drive along with your GPU. So that's just something to keep in mind if you know you need a lot of storage. And some other interesting things, if you're a content creator and you use something like Thunderbolt, while technically it was an Intel technology, you can still get Thunderbolt on certain motherboards that are Ryzen based. For example, the Gigabyte B550 Vision D motherboard, it does have the USB-C Titan Ridge Thunderbolt support built in. So you can definitely have Thunderbolt working. I've used that as well in the past. Sometimes Thunderbolt can be a little bit glitchy, especially on AMD, or if you're trying to do like some type of add-in card on Intel or something like that but the ones that come on the motherboard do seem to support it and there certainly will be a couple of other motherboards that also offer thunderbolt as well as USB-C. generally they're going to be geared more towards content creators if all you're doing pretty much is gaming or, or just casual use then i wouldn't really have to worry about thunderbolt that's more for the people that are doing like video editing or music production that a lot of different hardware may support thunderbolt and also keep in mind if you are going to be using one of amd's new big navi gpus like a 6800 and you have a ryzen 5000 you may be able to enable smart access memory. Now, this is going to be a little bit different for every different motherboard. So I'll just suggest you guys look up the exact directions. But basically, it amounts to in your BIOS, so you're going to have to change a couple of settings. That way, smart access memory will then be available. That, I would tell you guys, just look at the exact motherboard that you have, since each one is going to have a different configuration and different settings that you have to turn on. 
And then the last point is what is some software or even something like Ryzen Master that I use with AMD uh, motherboards and AMD processors. Ryzen Master allows you to keep a little bit of track over what's going on with your processor. You can even enable some type of like auto overclocking, have different profiles. Generally to monitor temperatures, I like to either use HW Info or maybe something like HW Monitor. They allow you to see if the temperature on your CPU is in check. A lot of times it's important to monitor the temperature just to make sure that everything was installed correctly from your thermal paste to your air cooler or your liquid cooler at least doing a couple of runs you don't have to do it all the time but at least seeing that the temperature falls within a certain range of normalcy that way a lot of times if you do a test and your temperatures are shooting up to 90 or 100 C that means that either your cooler is extremely inadequate but most likely maybe something's not really done tightly maybe the thermal paste didn't really adhere correctly all right guys so I hope you found these tips helpful remember to subscribe leave a comment below if you have any specific questions and I'll see you guys on the next video.